Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. From civil rights to labor rights, can the American labor movement bring it all together? Today on the Laura Flanders Show, we talk about Bernie Sanders, the Eric Garner case, and more with Larry Hanley, president of the Amalgamated Transit Union. All that and later in the show, Morgan Phillips tells us about how to bring science fiction and fantasy into direct action. And a few words from me on the U.S. corporation that pretends to be based in Ireland. It's all coming up. Welcome to our program. Will Labour endorse Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, or someone else entirely? Our next guest was the first union president to speak up about next year's election in the U.S., and he sounded pretty sweet on Vermont socialist Bernie Sanders. Larry Hanley is a former bus driver, now president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, which represents 200,000 workers across the U.S. and Canada. Ever since his election in 2010, he's been outspoken on everything from greening the economy to outsourcing public jobs. We're glad to have him back on the program. Larry, glad to have you. Glad to be here, Laura. Tell us to start about your members. Who are they? My members uh, drive and repair and clean buses uh, throughout the United States and Canada. We have members in uh, 46 states. We have members in nine provinces in Canada. And uh, we have some people that also work uh, in administrative positions for county officials uh, in various places in Florida, for example, um, operate ferries and some ambulances, uh, but primarily uh, transit workers. We do a lot of coverage on this program of what is generally and rather vaguely called the new economy. Like, mm -hmm. If we don't like this economy, what might replace it? What might be better? Has it ever been better? Uh, is it better in different places uh, around the world? What place do you see... Um, public transport playing? What place do you see it occupying in this sort of new economy? What's your picture? Well, first of all, uh, young people are abandoning cars in record numbers. Um, there are fewer uh, people, I think in the 18 to 25 year age group, that have driver's license licenses than did in 1960. They are more urban. They're moving to cities. Our cities are expanding at record rates and young people want transit. We believe that with overcrowded cities, and they're only going to be more crowded, um, if, if, if our governments can recognize the trend, we believe transit has a huge future in that economy and what's coming you know, in the next 20 years. Uh, but that's a big if because, mm -hmm. frankly, um, we have unlimited funds to blow up the, the world. But whenever you say, let's build a highway, a bridge, or, or add a bus, where are we going to get the money from? That's yeah. the question in Washington. That's what we have to overcome. So is that one of the things that attracts you to the Bernie Sanders campaign, Vermont <laughs> Socialist running for president? Bernie Sanders, well, I'll say what I've said to some others. Um, I love Hillary Clinton. I love many of the things she's done. Um, she has been, um, in many ways, uh, a courageous hero. Uh, I think for Americans and for women all over the world. But what, it, what do you say when loving Hillary Clinton is just not enough? And that's really the problem. Because what Bernie and Elizabeth Warren have been doing is speaking to issues that we know are true. Right. That we know in our hearts, for example, that the bankers got away with this depression. They got away with the biggest bank robbery in history um, while you know, the old story, you know, if you steal a loaf of bread, you go to jail. Uh, we know that. And we know that Bernie and Elizabeth Warren are speaking to that. Mm -hmm. Things like Social Security that's been under attack for the last 10 years. You know, Bernie says, look, um, defend Social Security? No, we have to increase Social Security. And he's right, we can. There are other solutions. And the problem with mainstream elected officials both Republicans and Democrats, is they are trapped in the same box, and we can only, for example, the war is something that's something we can't talk about. Mm -hmm. We can't say it's wrong to bomb all over the world. You mean the one that Hillary Clinton supported? She did, no question, and Bernie didn't, and that's true. So somehow or another, I, well, let me let me just go back to the the question of labor unions and, and Bernie. Bernie right now is speaking sincerely, not only with passion but with a record to the issues that our members care about. He's speaking about changing the way we do business in Washington um, in very specific terms. I would contrast that with Barack Obama, 
who spoke in generic terms about changing Washington. Um, but I think that Bernie has the opportunity. He's now, no Barack Obama. But he has the opportunity, by raising these issues, um, to excite a lot of people and to get people focused on what matters, not just people who follow him, but also mainstream politicians. So why not come on, Larry? Why not just come on out and endorse the guy? Well, um, we're going to go through a process, and I'm not joking, and it's not going to be a phony process. We are, look, the obvious concern about Bernie is can he win? And most people um, would say he can't, would say it's impossible in this environment for him to win, and that may well be true. And the hope that I think most people I know in the unions, certainly at the leadership of unions, I think a lot of members tend to be a little more hardcore on this. Mm -hmm. But the hope we have is that through the excitement that Bernie's generating, we can begin a whole new debate, not just about who the president is, but about where we're going as a country. And that's more important than the individual. Why not endorse Bernie? I'm not trying to escape the question. You can make a little history right here. We're right not here. ready. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that today. But, um, but we have not ruled it out, I can tell you that. And, and there are many people who would rule us criminally insane for saying that, but we are not ruling it out. I trust you, trust you telling the truth. I'm trusting there's a process, all of that. But I would put quite a lot of money on the fact that at the end of the day, you and most of the big labor organizations will root for the Democrat who is the most well-funded already, probably the most conservative and the most deemed likely to win. And you'll do that because your members will say, well, we want to be at the table. But being at the table for as many elections as I can remember has meant putting enormous amounts of union dues into candidates who promise things to labor and then don't deliver. Barack Obama promised card check, make it easier for you to have union elections. Uh, never happened. We never even heard about it again. Why do, we keep, why do you keep doing this? First of all, unions are not at the table. Uh, have not been in the time I've been in Washington. I was actually at a table in the White House, uh, at a meeting with the president, with all the members of the executive council of the AFL-CIO in 2012. And it was something of a scripted meeting. There were three of us who were going to speak to the president. And the rest of us were there, essentially witnessing the meeting. And I witnessed the president tell us, those of you who work, who represent workers in the public sector, need to get used to the idea that your members need to have their wages come in line with the private sector. My jaw dropped. <laughs> this is the leader of the free world, the leader of the Democratic Party, the person in whom our members place their hope and trust and faith. And worked. And work. And he just told us that his view was that public sector workers uh, would have to be getting haircuts, economic haircuts. Uh, nonetheless, we went out, and this answers part of your question. After that meeting, we went out, I personally went out, and I was working on Election Day in Cleveland, Ohio, trying to get the vote out to elect Barack Obama. Mm. Because 2012, like 2016, will, will found us in a place where the options were heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. And frankly, um, and I know this doesn't really answer the deep questions, but I think Bernie Sanders does, mm -hmm. the deep questions of how can you cooperate with a government of either party that is disassembling the labor mm -hmm. movement mm -hmm. before your eyes? that is sending jobs overseas, that is eliminating regulations that protect workers and families? And I think the answer is, in the end, you can't. Um, but then the question becomes, <laughs> how do you lead your members in a way that can actually be successful in making change? Mm -hmm. That's a far more complicated question. Well, how do you, and do you draw any lessons from the party of Podemos in Spain? fighting a good fight right now for the next election. The party didn't even exist a year and a half ago. Syriza in Greece may not have gotten the best deal out of the Europeans, but better than anyone that and they tried. Uh, preceded them. They could have said, their people could have said, well, we should just stick with what we've got because it's too risky building something new. I, you don't do that. On the other hand, you recognize the, the limitations of your own power. 
Uh, and at the same time, I think you recognize the opportunities that you have. So what we've done, and I can only speak to my union now, transit workers in the U.S. and Canada, um, we have not pinned all our hopes on the electoral system, whether it be the presidency or any other particular office. We recognize that the forces against us are huge. And we are trying to organize riders. We have 100 riders who ride our system for every member of our union. And our goal is to get them engaged in the process. And you have some record of that. Wasn't there in New York one of the locals organized, was it Keep America Moving? We were involved in that, yes. A coalition, it right? Was a, it was a coalition of us and the TWU that were involved mm -hmm. in that. And we've been doing that all over the country, and we're beginning it in Canada. Actually, Canada, fortunately, lags behind in, in some of the serious anti-worker moves that have happened. Uh, unfortunately, we've lagged behind in catching up also out there. But we've had successes all over the United States. We've had them in Massachusetts. We've had them... In Wisconsin, in the midst of the Scott Walker recall, we were successful in a small town of western Wisconsin in restoring transit through a ballot initiative. Seventy, this is the interesting thing. In 70% of the times that voters get a chance in the U.S. to vote on raising their own taxes to provide more transit, they vote yes. Yeah. We just did it in Clayton County, Georgia, where the MARTA system in Atlanta um, did not reach Clayton County. And the voters, this is an interesting one, uh, in the election in 2014, the voters in Clayton County came out in huge numbers and voted to raise their taxes to be part of the MARTA system. And on the same day, more people voted in that referendum than voted either for governor or for senator in Clayton County. Voting for public transport. So the issue was more important than the biggest races in the state. You drove a bus for many years in Staten Island mm -hmm. um, where the family of Eric Garner the chokehold victim, um, there was recently a settlement made with them. Mm -hmm. Where's your union, how is your union working um, to address racial justice in this country? And do you well, relate to the Black Lives Matter movement at all? Oh, absolutely. I do, personally, without a doubt. Um, I've made it very clear to all audiences in our union that I speak to that this union will stand on the side of justice in every case. Um, Staten Island is a case, obviously, I lived there for many years and I know a little bit about the island. I can tell you my personal view is you could not look at that video and say that that cop was right. You can't. Um, on the other hand, and this is not an on the other hand I excuse the actions of that cop. It was an awful, awful thing that happened to Eric Garner. Um, and he was a victim. No question about that. Not escaping that. On the other hand, these are systemic issues. Yeah. When uh, cops kill young people, anyone, um, and we blame just the cop, we're making a big mistake because it is the system that created the violence. It was the decisions. Why is this police department going after and arresting people for selling cigarettes on a street corner to start with? And why do they bring in, you know, 10 or 20 cops to take down a guy in a street? Why couldn't Eric Garner simply be given a ticket? Those are not decisions made by that cop. Mm -hmm. So the brute force, you know, we hire cops to have yeah. brute force. And we have to admit that as a society. But then the leadership of the police department, the leadership of the city, needs to be the adult in the room that restrains yeah. those cops to make sure they don't do things like that. So that, the, the thing, again, it's, it's just like what happened with Michael Brown. We could easily scapegoat that cop and say he, he's a bad guy. And he may well be. Yeah. But we're avoiding the big issues. Bus drivers have an interesting history when it comes to civil rights. You've been in the center of it more than once. Many Thinking times. Of the Birmingham bus boycott. Well, that's interesting because, uh, as you know, uh, it was one of our members who was driving the bus uh, that Rosa Parks got on and refused to give up her seat on, and, and our member uh, notified the police and got her arrested. Um, and Rosa Parks became the best organizer of transit riders in the history of the United States. And that's what our union is dedicated to doing, is, is organizing bus riders. Um, we really could not respect Rosa Parks more for what she did. She was a, a real hero. Uh, and I mentioned to a, a leader, a civil rights leader, a couple of years ago, I told him that I had investigated and found out that the bus driver was actually a member. We checked our roles. And he said, you know, Larry, he was enforcing the law. <laughs> And that's true. And again, uh, one could easily say that was a bad bus driver. Well, no, it was a bad society. You know, it was a bad, bad society. And, and 
and we had we and we've worked a long time and come a long way in terms of achieving justice. We have a long way to go. We're talking around about Labor Day. Why do we have Labor Day when the rest of the world celebrates May Day, May 1st? <laughs> well, primarily because of the Russian Revolution in 1917, um, which, uh, which uh, resulted in a thing called the Red Scare in the 1940s and 50s in the United States. I've heard of it. Well, okay, so, so what America is completely, um, because we've been taught to be that, anti-communist, anti-socialist, and our country, our official um, record is that uh, May Day is a socialist communist holiday so therefore uh, we currently don't celebrate it. That's just a history lesson for the young people <laughs> watching the show. Larry Hanley, thank you so much. Really looking forward to catching up with you again sometime soon. My pleasure. Thanks for work. Morgan Phillips is a writer, organizer, and social worker, and a direct action trainer. We spoke to her at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit about bringing creativity into direct civil disobedience. There's so much unknown when you're going into something where your body's on the line for a political reason. And people have a hard time letting go of the politics enough to think about the strategy and the tactic and also how their action is going to deconstruct narratives and tell a new story. So there's a lot of great organizations that do great story-based strategy work like um, the Center for Story-Based Strategy and they, they do a really good job at that but like how to marry that with direct action tactical training. So I decided that instead of orchestrating direct actions within the world we live in, I was going to take well-known imagined worlds, so Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Wizard of Oz, The Simpsons, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, all of these places that people already spend a great deal of their time living and thinking about and deconstructing and saying like, okay, now you're going, we're going to challenge those narratives. Like there's problems with Star Trek. There are problems within Harry Potter. Like the narratives fit within a dominant paradigm of white, militaristic, imperialistic, you know, and so it's like there's tons of place to challenge, but we love them, we obviously do, because we spend so much time in them. And so saying like, we're gonna go into those worlds with the, that clear confines of what that, the canon is for that world, and we're gonna develop direct actions based on these existing direct action tools. Um, and so I did my very first one ever here at the AMC, like four, three or four years ago. And it was like the most fun I'd ever spent an hour and a half in my life. Like people dug deep into abolishing nuclear energy in Springfield, like in the world of the Simpsons, and then house elf liberation in Harry Potter. Dobby has heard of your greatness, sir, but never has he been asked to sit down by a wizard like an equal. But in doing that, they were bringing themselves to it. They were like, why does this matter to me? Because while well, like, thinking about the exclusion of people from magical education, like all the people in my life, they get excluded from education or the only type of education we get access to. So people were bringing themselves to it. And then we were talking about very real tactics of blockading and shutting things down. What are the things you have to think about? Who are the allies you have to think about that might exist in that world? And then saying like, so see, when you're in the world we have to live in, like that same process happens. And so it's just, just the same way that reading speculative and visionary fiction is instructive, living in those worlds and practicing the tactics and the, the applying the organizing principles is instructive practice of just getting into the routine of talking that way and thinking that way so that when you apply it to your, your everyday organizing life, it feels natural to do that. It's been a, a workshop that's evolved and now it's done in a lot of places. Adrian and Walida both do it now too and keep making it evolve and change and adding new worlds like so Alice in Wonderland, Willy Wonka, Battlestar Galactica, they all have been added in recent months as the participants bring to it the worlds that they've spent a lot of time in and thinking about the way that oppression plays out in these narrative worlds that we love so much and wanting to challenge that. There was a really great one that happened here at the AMC where um, a group of participants were in Star Wars, so a galaxy far, far away, and they were on the moon of Endor. They were Ewoks, but they recognized that there was an alliance, a potential alliance to be made with stormtroopers and like the Imperial soldiers who were just stuck on this moon 
and that there was probably a lot of distance between them and the Empire's mission and that they could probably work and talk with them to sh like shut, take over the bases rather than blow them up but turn them into defensive outposts. But the, the whole bulk of their work was like, okay, how do we have that conversation with them? Like, how do we kind of feel out what their politics might be or be able to shape to be? And so like, it's less about what is the action that we're gonna take, but the process of getting there. Like, how do we say we all live on this moon together? How are we gonna make sure that the empire doesn't come down and blow us up? And so that was amazing and fascinating. There was also one that folks did um, uh, within Harry Potter where, and that's usually the one that people go the furthest with, um, but the one where they were really thinking a lot about um, the way in which education, like if you don't fit, if you can't fit into a classroom, you'd get denied education. And so they were talking about squibs, which in Harry Potter are people who are born into magical families but don't have magic and how they are just told to go assimilate into the real world and they don't get access to that. And they were like, that's really messed up. And that's a part of the story I love that makes me so sad. But they were also like, that's also something that's happening in our public schools every single day. Like kids who can't function in those classrooms, they just get through the school to prison pipeline, suspension, expulsion, like boredom, they just leave um, if they can't conform. And so they took the things that they had already been doing in their public school and they combined it with Hogwarts and they had this total like, they designed a teach-in that they were gonna do with the wizarding students about squib liberation and they were gonna have speakers and they invented this whole thing and I was like, that's real, like you did that in real life and you're doing that now and like they were able to take it further with like leafleting campaigns and getting parents involved and finding, and the best part is like, like where can we find our squib elders? you know, who have survived this and probably did this before and like where can we find them? And I was like, that's so real. That's like what we have to do. So those are like some of my favorite examples. That was Morgan Phillips recorded at the Allied Media Conference in Detroit. You can get more information about the conference at our website. There's U.S. law and then there's global trade law. And if you ever felt inclined to believe that Congress rules the roost, just take a look at what's happened to the Obama administration's pledge to take on corporate tax evaders. Obama has talked for years about shutting down tax havens that let companies re-register overseas to avoid paying U.S. taxes. He signed new laws and hired new officers. He's also expressed support for the common sense No Federal Contracts for Corporate Deserters Act. Real name. It would bar tax evading companies from getting government contracts. When the talk hit the walk, the walk hit the skids, or more precisely, global trade rules. According to Bloomberg News, when one of the nation's largest re-registered companies argued that barring contracts would violate World Trade Organization non-discrimination rules, the administration seems to have sided with the manufacturer. The company in question, Ingersoll Rand, switched its tax address from New Jersey to Bermuda in 2001 and then to tax-friendly Ireland a few years later. Still, a Homeland Security lawyer in the administration cleared them for government work last year, and just this spring the company won a federal contract to install energy-saving equipment on U.S. military bases. According to Bloomberg, the White House has declined to comment, and that's just where things stand, except the exodus overseas continues. Burger King and the medical device maker Medtronic recently joined the flow of 50 U.S. companies, mostly in the last five years, who've taken off, taking almost $20 billion in lost tax revenues with them. It's the global corporation's world. We just live in it. And in case you were wondering where Ingersoll Rand lives, CEO Michael Lamich lives and works in Davidson, North Carolina, along with the company's entire administrative office. His compensation jumped 30% last year to $19.4 billion on account of the company's surging profits. You can get more information at our website and write to me, laura at grittv.org. Tell me what you think. Octavia's brood was like, oh no, I just outed myself as a nerd to Mumia. And Mumia just flowed with it. And he was like, right, live long and prosper. I was like, 
what is happening right now? <laughs> so much of how we've been socialized to be human is to resist change, to try to create these institutions, to take over everything. One, two, three. From somewhere, maybe on the Enterprise, this is Mumia Abu Jamal. Today on the Laura Flanders Show, we travel to New Orleans. Our mayor and too many of our business people wanted a market-based recovery, and that's what we got. Uh, we should have fought for a, a community-based recovery. And later, New Orleans poet Sonny Patterson. We want to see our homes rebuilt. Be still. Be patient. It takes time to build these neighborhood associations. But really, Mr. Developer, what does that mean? 